urban communities, and here I'm primarily talking about the capital city of Merida. They start out in, in discrete communities, the way that they start out as a kind of discrete ethno-racial category. Um, and here, if you look, um, this is also doesn't quite transfer as well, but this area here is, as I labeled here, is the Trasa, which is the central colonial core. There's still two big pyramids that are left. This one's not torn down until the early 17th century, and this is not actually finally destroyed until the mid 20th century. There are still pieces of it left. Um, but these are the two huge ceremonial pyramids of the Maya city that Merida was built upon. Here's the Spanish cathedral, so here's the Spanish plaza. Um, these are the Maya communities, Santiago, San Sebastián, not that. San Cristóbal, La Mejora, and Santa Ana. These five make a kind of a star shape, and these are classified as, as Maya pueblos in the colonial period, and you can see how they're deliberately put right on the edges of the <coughs> trasa. What about people of African descent? What's they, are they given their own little parish? Yes, up here initially in Santa Lucia. Santa Lucia. Symbolically also right on the edge, but kind of in this middle position. So here's where the Spaniards are, and then the Mayas around here, and then African slaves are put here. But what happens very quickly within a few generations is as the Spanish and mixed race population grows, um, Spaniards start buying the um, agricultural land around here and building houses. This, of course, is way buried in the middle of Maria, which is, has, what, over a million, million, 1.2 million people now. Um, so the Afro-Yucatecan parishes move down to Jesus, and for the rest of the colonial period remains down here. It's the only colonial church which no longer exists. It was torn down, I believe this, in the 1970s. I think by the 1970s there would be some appreciation of, I guess it was Afro-Yucatecan parish, maybe that's part of it. So this remains here, this kind of interstitial middling position in, in, in kind of spatial terms. But there's another, there's another phenomenon that's happening that, that, that breaks down these, dis these discrete boundaries, and that is the pace of <coughs> miscegenation. So that if you were to go into 18th century Merida, you wouldn't be able to walk from block to block and be able to see that you were moving from one neighborhood to another. Um, you wouldn't be able to see, oh, here's where Spaniards live, and now these are afro yucatecans and then he's a, here are Mayas, because the city is becoming uh, such a melting pot and there's so much miscegenation going on. So the, the, these kind of discrete communities would be very hard for you to see visually. You'd have to spend a lot of time to be able to see how here's Spanish households and Mayas um, and Afro-Yucatecans are working, sometimes living in these households, and they're, me they're meeting um, Afro-Yucatecan women are having children out of wedlock that are fathered by the Spaniards who are the heads of those households, and then the Afro-Yucatecan men are marrying the Maya women that are working in the households, this kind of double miscegenation process that's going on. And the other, last thing I'll say about that is this little table here. This was a ridiculous amount of um, time that it took me to go through marriage records from the whole of colonial Merida. So from the 1580s up until about 1800, um, hundreds and hundreds of these records, and I came up with the staggering discovery that it's about 50-50. <laughs> and in, in fact, at some point, I even had it tracked by decade, because I thought it was gonna, I was going to have a nice kind of bar chart, so you could see the curve and so on. No, I didn't really change much. Just generation after generation. What are the choices that are being made here by men who are classified? These are the, this is the classification in the marriage record, right, by the Spanish priest. Name. And half, about half are choosing um, women who are classified, and I kind of, these are basically Afro-Yucatecan, all the classifications here. And then these are the Maya Mestiza classifications. And then was there a difference here? Well, a little bit. Right? Uh, men who have been classified as pago mulato, so more often likely to be free, born free, not born in Africa, and so on. A little bit more likely to choose my, but basically it's 50 food. Now, you, if you think about that over the course of the whole colonial period, no wonder it's hard to find a, an, and identify a, a discrete, distinct afro yucatecan community within Merida. Because right? this is a miscegenative process that is making a multiracial 
community um, that breaks down a, a distinctly Afro-Yucatecan community. But, of course, the flip side of it is, and I think in some ways kind of a really interesting question that is only, I only begin to explore in this book, it means that Mayas aren't just Mayas anymore, right? They're Afro-Mayas. Okay, the final thing I want to say um, under this category of denying the Afro-Yucatecan past uh, is to sort of answer the question of why. Right? If this is true, if that there are all these people of African descent in Yucatan, um, this is an important part of Yucatecan history, uh, is it true, and, and does it have any kind of larger implications? I mean, who, you know, who cares, right? What's the point? Well, I think there are six factors that explain um, why the Afro-Yucatecan past has been kind of buried. Uh, and I think that these factors arguably can be made relevant or can prompt questions regarding Mexican history as a whole and, and perhaps the history of other countries in Latin America as well. For, the first one is the pace of miscegenation. I have already talked about that, the degree to which there's intermarriage between Afro-Yucatecans and Mayas and the degree to which there is <coughs> Biological interaction, if you like, extramarital reproduction going on between um, Spaniards and afro yucatecans um, I'm going to be very brief on these points, otherwise I won't get through all of them. I can come back to any of them if you want. Secondly, the decline of the slave trade. The slave trade in Mexico is not abolished until 1829. It's not abolished at the time of independence. It takes a little bit longer. Um, when it's abolished in Yucatan, uh, there's not much of a reaction, there's not much of a, a kind of fanfare either. There's a few written protests by slave owners, um, there aren't, there isn't kind of a big, big fuss about it, there isn't sort of dancing in the streets, it's kind of a, sort of a little bit of a, of a non-event. Um, and that is largely because the slave trade has declined so much in the decades leading up to that point. <coughs> Thirdly, changes in terminology. I've been talking about how ethno-racial terms and categories are very, if you want to use the word, fuzzy, fluid, plastic, there's all kinds of adjectives <coughs> that can be applied to that. Um, in colonial Latin American historiography, there's a phrase that has been much abused, which in Spanish is the sistema de castas, or in English, the caste, the caste system. Uh, we're beginning to understand now that there was no such system. What there was wasn't system-like or systematic, uh, and that these terms are kind of a, a, a fuzzy and fluid all through the colonial period. In Yucatan, that's particularly the case, and 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 one example of that is these two words, mulato and pago. So mulato technically is supposed to be somebody who's mixed European and African descent, and pago is supposed to be indigenous or in Yucatan would be my uh, African descent. But they don't use them that way in Yucatan. In Yucatan they just take one of those words and at any one point that's the kind of term in vogue to describe somebody who's of mixed racial descent. Who's not claiming to be a Spaniard and is not in a kind of Indio, Indio category or Maya category. Instead of everybody else can be Pardo or Mulat. So if you jump back in time to one year, everybody's using one word Fifteen years later, there's a sort of change in fashion, and one word has just gone out of usage, and the other word is the, is the prevailing word. That is not at all what is in the historiography, is what we supposedly have learned about the way this Sistema de Castas work. Now, how does that feed into this idea of denying the Afro-Yucatecan past? As we go towards the end of the colonial period, this, the number of terms gets smaller and fewer and fewer, and they gradually kind of disappear. At the time of independence, uh, you're not supposed to use those terms at all anymore. Everybody is supposed to just be citizens. Um, but actually, what they do is they carry on using the term mestizo. So everybody of African descent, any of those African, Afro-Yucatecan related terms, whether it's negro, moreno, mulato, part of those all get folded into the category of mestizo. So that anyone who's not Spaniard or Maya is then mestizo then. During the 19th century, mestizo then becomes a kind of polite way to refer to somebody of indigenous descent. So in the end, you just have Spaniards and mestizos, that's it. So where are the Afro-Yucatecs? You can see that.